fight from within. You're about to go behind enemy lines. City. You're now going behind enemy lines with Gene Baradelli and Russ Gallo. Behind Enemy Lines. Coming to you live on tape from the People's Republic of New York State, New York City. I don't even know where we're from anymore. Hey there, how you doing America? Gene Baradelli here with you once again. So glad you could be with us, whether you're listening at www.behindenemylinesradio.us or if you're checking us out on your AM or FM radio dial, we're glad that you're locked in Lotus and with us wherever you may be in this great wide world. Or, if we're traveling along with you as a podcast, you know it, we're glad to be along for the ride. And this week, folks, I got a lot to talk about, because honestly, it's been a while since you and I just talked, you know? Uh, we, we had interviews, Robert Patillo was great, by the way, last week. Check out the show from last week if you can. I was able to do his show uh, this past weekend at WAOK, archives are up. At our website, www.behindenemylinesradio.us. Trying to get a record for most plugs for the, for the site. Uh, and obviously the big news that we're discussing this week is the confirmation has happened. Our long national nightmare is over. Judge Brett Kavanaugh is now Associate Justice Brett Kavanaugh. He was confirmed 50 to 48. Uh, for those of you who have been living under a rock or maybe it's your first time in this country... Uh, you should probably know that by now. And uh, we saw, of course, a very impassioned speech by one of the one of the senators who was really on the fence, Susan Collins. Uh, could have been a little shorter for my liking, you know, 45, 48 minutes, whatever it was. Took a little bit of time, but hey, we got there, and, and luckily her vote was yay. Uh, Jeff Flake did not flake out ultimately. That was welcome. And unfortunately, we, we did lose one Republican. Let's uh, all... Take off our hats, stand up, and bow our heads for the soon-to-be ex-senator from the great state of Alaska, uh, Lisa Murkowski. Although you never know with her, she did win as, as you know, a, I believe it was a write-in vote that actually sent her back to the Senate. So you never know with her. She may she may work her way back in. Uh, all politics is local, folks. That's all I can say about that. And let's also give an, a nice attaboy to Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Crossing over to the to the good side of the force, as I like to call it, and voting for Brett Kavanaugh, and and there's more to celebrate, folks, than just a fifth justice on the court now that you can identify as a conservative justice, as an originalist, as as someone who believes in uh, calling balls and strikes rather than judicial advocacy and you know legislating from the bench. That, that's one thing to celebrate, and honestly, that's why I voted for President Trump. Uh, I was a one-issue voter, and he fulfilled my requirements in his first term of office, in his first two years. So I'm very happy that my vote went to President Trump, and looking forward to doing it again if we keep getting more of this. If we keep on winning. Keep up the winning. So we have that aspect of it, absolutely. But really, this is more of a victory for American political culture, um, the American way of life, I may sound a, a little hokey right now, a little corny, truth, justice, and the American way and all that. But the 50 senators that voted for Judge Kavanaugh sent a message, a message that the American way of life and our political culture and our way of thinking matters. And we're not going to allow the angry mob uh, the automatons, the zombies, the, the democratic voters out there that uh, protest and, you know, the, the toxic left. 
We're not going to let them change the fundamentals of our way of life. We're not going to let them get away with ridding our culture of the presumption of innocence. We're not going to get rid of innocent until proven guilty. Something that we start out with with little kids. We start out with no tattling in life. You remember back when you were little and your parents would tell you not to tattle? That was their way of saying, don't bear false witness to whomever you're tattling on. Don't be that guy or gal. If you're going to say something, say it and mean it. Don't just try to get someone in trouble. Not that I'm saying that Professor Christine Blasey Ford was doing that, but the whole idea that you're convicted or that you're culpable or that you're liable in whatever setting it may be, judicial, non-judicial, whatever the case may be, that you're basically concluded to have done something that you didn't do before you even get a moment to defend yourself. That idea goes out the window. Thank goodness. Burden of proof, another great idea that is in our legal system. It's been around since time immemorial, hundreds of years, going back to our ancestors and, you know, common law. The idea that if you're going to say something, you have to be the one to prove it. The person asserting has to be the one to prove it. You can't prove a negative in this world, folks. And that's what Democrats were trying to do. Senate Democrats were trying to get Brett Kavanaugh into a position where he would have to prove a negative. Professor Ford's own attorneys wanted him to testify first to defend allegations that had not been placed on the record Cart before the horse, folks. These are victories that go beyond the courtroom. They're our everyday way of life. As much as Democrats want to say, burden of proof, presumption of innocence don't matter. They matter in our everyday discourse. Because whether you like it or not, the law permeates our lives. I know this, I'm a lawyer. It definitely permeates my life. But to say that these things don't affect your everyday life, go on a job interview. And see if someone makes a false allegation against you. See if the interview calls you back and says, hey, we we heard about this. What's this all about? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But when they do, you know you got a good employer. The other thing that this whole process taught us is that there are no levels that the toxic left, and I'm not talking about everyone in the Democrat Party, but the toxic left, the paid protesters, the, uh, you know, the cause heads, the ones that are out there all the time protesting for the sake of protesting, the ones who made up their minds about Brett Kavanaugh 30 seconds after his name was announced, that they had to stop him at all costs by any means necessary. We found out exactly what by any means necessary means and the depths and the levels they'll go to. And again, I'm not talking about Christine Blasey Ford. I'm talking about the manipulation And the way that she was treated, as we said on Newsmax, Russ and I, on our Newsmax Insiders column a couple of weeks back, nothing but sympathy for Christine Blasey Ford. I do believe that something happened to her. I don't think Brett Kavanaugh did it, but I do believe something happened to her. But instead of having her trust and her faith really valued... The Democrats, and specifically Senator Feinstein, waited to the most opportune moment to try to torpedo Brett Kavanaugh, to try to derail him when all else failed. And that's a breach of trust to Christine Ford as well. That's the lengths that the toxic left will go to, and those who are looking to appease the mob. Do I think Dianne Feinstein is part of the toxic left, or, or Cory Booker, or Kamala Harris? Yes and no. I think they can be reasonable, intelligent people. I disagree with them vehemently. But I don't think that they're just outraged for the sake of outrage. I think they have motive behind what they do. And Diane Feinstein certainly showed that. But as far as the mob goes, you know, we, we saw what they'll do. They'll yell. They'll scream. They'll disrupt. They'll call people racist. They'll, they'll misogynist. The whole, the whole thing. You're mansplaining. You're lawyer-splaining. But it's not enough. You know, uh, they're trying to engage with people on the other side in the worst way possible. That turns them off. Uh, The left is basically saying that we're going to become more obnoxious than we ever have been before. They're not just going to 
show up in crazy outfits, like handmaids or or disrupt meetings. They're going to stand outside in, in groups. One person says something, everybody else repeats it like an automaton, like a zombie. And they, you've seen the videos out there. And they're going to walk around like they own the joint and think that they can intimidate and threaten their way to what they want to do. Rand Paul's wife, Kelly uh, Paul, had a great open letter to Senator Cory Booker this week talking about how she now sleeps with a gun at her bedside because she's worried about what may happen to her and any violence coming to her home like it did for her husband because the level of discourse that the toxic left has created has really dragged down this country to the lowest denominator. You want to talk about President Trump and his uh, vulgar, brash, coarse way of handling things, bringing down discourse. Let's talk about the left doing it. The increased obnoxiousness. I'm trying to understand how this is going to help them in, in the midterms. They already have become the most annoying individuals on the planet. If they're going to keep pushing this envelope, and then pushing socialism on top of that. I don't know exactly what we're in for, folks, for the for the midterms, but it's starting to look better and better for the red wave over the blue wave. If these people go at poll places like the way that they went at senators, buckle up, folks. You may be in for another November surprise in 2018. You know, I was reading an article. I, I like to browse the Internet. I like to go through... Uh, my Facebook feed, I like to go through our Twitter feed, at BEL underscore radio, where you can find us all the time. And th- there's this one article from the Babylon Bee. For those of you who don't know, it's one of those satire sites like The Onion. Uh, talking about the, the toxic left. And uh, really uh, satirizing them and, and what they did. Uh, they come up with this faux news article, this fake news article. Uh, saying that the reason why the left thinks they failed is that they just weren't obnoxious enough. You know, yelling and, you know, calling people's names and confronting people in elevators, that was enough. So they need to screech even louder next time. And that even more people, if they're going to try to convince others that they're really sure that they're right about everything, that everyone else is wrong about it. And as I was reading the article and, and laughing to myself... I started to come to the awareness that this is how some of them think. We just need to get louder. We need to organize more. We need to get more people who think like us to fall in line. And, you know, we will go to the meeting. We will go to the meeting and talk to this person and talk to this person. And all that nonsense that they were doing, they think they need more of that. And that's going to help them out. Something you learn. As an attorney, you learn a lot of things that you don't need in life. Uh, just just take the LSAT and need I say more. But the one thing that, that law school does teach you is persuasion. The art of persuasion, the art of talking to somebody. To be able to, to distill things down to the level of understanding of your audience. You can be the smartest person in the world and use all the five-letter words out there. Uh, you know, the five-dollar words out there. You know, pontificate and, you know, all, all, all those things that you can do because you're such a brainiac, right? But that don't mean a thing if the people talking to you don't understand and are, aren't convinced by you. So, not that I want to give tips to people out there who are looking to protest, but let's just say this. If you think that what you're doing is persuasive... By all means, keep doing it. Because all it means to me is that it's going to turn off more and more people. People don't like to be preached to. People don't like to be talked down to. People don't like to be told what to do. People don't want to open their minds and think exactly like you. They need to come over to your side in a way that's not offensive to them, not offensive to their sensitivities, and not offensive to their intelligence. And that's why the left, I believe, are going to lose when it comes to Senate races. We're going to take a quick break right now, but when we come back, we got more to talk about with Kavanaugh. And also, has the left fallen in love with big money? Gene Baradelli, Behind Enemy Lines, will be back right after these brief words. If you're a longtime listener of the show, or maybe this is your first time listening, you can probably tell that me and the gang here, we like to have our share of fun, whether it's on or off. 